Welcome to the Actuary podcast. I'm Rinin Wang, an actuary and features editor at the Actuary magazine. Today, I'm joined by Georgina Beddenham, an actuary at the Government Actuaries Department, who is currently on secondment at the Centre for Disaster Protection. Could you start by telling us about your career so far? Uh, yes. So, um, so my current role um, is as an actuary at the, the UK Government Actuaries Department, um, and I've been at GAD for the past 10 years. Um, but for the past couple of years, I've been specialising in disaster risk finance. Um, so at the moment, I'm actually on a secondment at the Centre for Disaster Protection, um, where I've been for nearly a year now, um, focusing on disaster risk financing. Um, in terms of my career so far, so as I mentioned, I've been at um, GAD, uh, the Government Actuaries Department, for the past 10 years. Um, and whilst that's obviously at the same place for the past 10 years, it, I've had quite a variety in terms of projects and clients and different types of work that I worked on, um, which has been really interesting. So um, I started in, in pensions and then I transitioned across to um, the insurance and investment team at, at GAD. Um, and in that team, I've done quite quite a variety of different things. So I started um, working on insurance type arrangements within the public sector. Um, so I did that for um, probably about four years, working on, on different clients there. Um, then transitioned to looking at contingent liabilities across UK government. Um, I then went on a brief secondment to the Potential Regulation Authority. Um, and then when I came back from there, I started to specialise and focus on disastrous financing. And that's what sort of brought me to my secondment that I'm on at the moment. It's quite a variety. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get on to the centre in a moment. But actually, before we jump into your career, I think lots of us have a vague concept of the GAD and maybe they work on pensions and healthcare. Um, I think a lot of the things that you've just mentioned, um, the contingent liability, wouldn't be familiar to lots of actuaries. So would you mind just actually giving us a quick, more complete picture of what the government actuaries mandate is and what the department does? Yes, yes, sure. So um, so um, GAD is a uh, non-ministerial government department. So um, we are part of government um, and um, those that work at GAD are, are civil servants. Um, but we are a non-ministerial department and we're a shared service provider across government. So um, we work with all different government departments and, and public sector bodies on, on quite a variety of different projects and, and pieces of work. So it can be quite um quite an exciting um, um, place to work in the sense that we get to do a lot of interesting projects around the challenges that UK government faces. So we can be brought in on some really interesting areas of work. So as you mentioned, there's kind of the, the core work that, that we do and have done for a long time now, like the valuation of the public service pension schemes, um, also um, the analysis that underpins the state pension age and the National Insurance Fund. Um, but also more recently, we've, um, we've got a growing area of work in sort of data analysis, modeling, as I say, insurance and investment as well. Um, so we can we, we do quite a variety of different things. So, for example, on the insurance side, um, we, we um, work with the um, NHS Resolution Organization, which um, looks at managing clinical negligence claims against the NHS. Um, and we we get brought into some quite interesting areas of work when there's particular sort of challenges that government faces. So, for example, during COVID, um, GAD was involved in some really interesting projects there. So, for example, we had um, some staff go on secondment to test and trace and, and were involved in thinking about sort of what the different risk groups might be with regards to, to vaccines and how to manage those. Um, but we were also involved in um, thinking about um, schemes that government might have had to set up to be a backstop for um, where there might have been insurance gaps due to COVID. For example, in the film and TV industry, um, we were involved in some analysis to kind of get a scheme in place that government could cover um, to, to get film and TV um, back up and running where there were, there were certain series that weren't able to, uh, to, to run due to the worry of um, COVID um, affecting the, uh, the filming. Uh, so th this sounds quite different to what people might traditionally think of as actuarial work. Do you feel like you're uh, sort of internal consultants or is there still a sort of actuarial core to the work that you do? 
Yeah, so so it is, I think, yeah, the thing I found um, working at GAD is that there's no typical actuary, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, you know, we work on quite a variety of things. Some things are quite traditional, as I say, pension scheme valuations, some of the insurance um, type arrangements that we work with across the public sector. We, we do you know, reserving and pricing and some of those traditional areas of actuarial work. But I think for the more broader pieces around sort of risk management and um, financial liabilities, I think a lot of it is actually using the broader actuarial skill set um, to add value where 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 we can. So, for example, um, quantifying risks that are difficult to quantify. Um, you know. Um, perhaps doing things like scenario modelling and stress testing. Um, but also, I think, bringing that um, analytical lens where we can sort of think through problems and issues. Quite often, some of the, the, the issues that we're tackling haven't been tackled before or there aren't yeah. set ways of doing that. So I think a lot of the work, we have to be quite creative in the way that we do things. And But I think that sort of logical thought process, um, you know, that, that grounding in... Um, analysis and, and mathematical techniques um, and, and that really helps us and we can apply that to different situations so um, yes it can be quite quite varied and probably not not quite what I thought I might be getting into <laughs> when I first joined so uh, it's yeah it's been really interesting. So to paint a picture for us how would a project do you want to talk us through a project so how does it start who has the initiative who reaches out to GAD how does the team get set up? How do you generate ideas and so on? Yeah, so I think um, first and foremost, I think because we, we've we been around quite a long time and worked with lots of different government departments and I think that that helps that we've got good um, relationships with different government departments. Um, we've worked on quite a variety of projects so that can quite often um, mean that there are links there. So if something comes up, someone, at, you know, a certain department might think, right, we'll, we'll get in touch with GAD and see if they can help. So I think that helps. I think we we try and um, we we try and sort of um, make sure that we've we've we're in, we're engaged and we're you know sharing the message of the kind of work that we do do. So a lot of a lot of the stuff that we have done, we've sort of produced case studies and things that are on our website so that other departments can see the sort of things that we can do. Um, and then I think once um, you know the the we we've had um, you know a, a client come to us and say there's this problem that I'm facing, not quite sure how to tackle it, is this something GAD could help with? Um, then, you know, there's that engagement right at the start. Sometimes th there are things that we can't help with um, and, you know, that there are, uh, there is, you know, a big analysis function across government um, that, that, can, that can support some of those projects. Um, but some obviously some projects we can add value and we can we can be helpful and we can come up with um, novel ways of, of approaching things so I think in those circumstances we tend to take it away form a bit of a team around it I think we've got quite a variety of um, uh, a lot of my colleagues come from lots of different backgrounds so we have um, as I say within within my team in particular the insurance investment team we've got uh, people who've come from private sector insurers, who've um, come from an investment background. We've got um, people who've been at GAD a long time, so they've seen other problems that that, that we've that we've worked on um, with different government departments. So there can be a lot of that sort of shared expertise, and and we can bring a team together around that. So um, yeah, and I think a lot of it, as I say, can be it, there's a lot of creativity there. We sometimes have to you know sit down and 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 really sort of talk through um you know it, particularly if it's, a, if it's a novel problem it's something that's new that we've that we've not tackled before i think we you know we sit down we talk through it we we engage with the client as well they 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 work with us and and yeah it can be quite an interesting process i think sometimes you can start with a way of doing things and then it might not be quite right and then you go back and you change things um i think leaning on some of our you know 
I suppose, grounding in sort of analytical techniques, some of the traditional actuarial ways of doing things as well, like reserving techniques, evaluation techniques can be helpful as well in, in different ways. You can sort of um, slightly, you know, adapt those and, and that can that can be useful in different circumstances as well. So you've been at the Centre for Disaster Protection for about a year now uh, and you're, you're there on secondment. Um, first of all, it, are the commons quite common? You've done one of the PRA as well. Yeah. So um, yeah. So uh, within GAD, um, I've been quite lucky, really. As I say, I've been on been on two um, really interesting and different comments um, at the PRA and and, and also at the centre. Um, it, it's so comments are viewed, and I agree that it that they're a really useful tool for actually getting to know clients getting to build knowledge of the sector that you're that you're working in um and so it, it's it's something that gad um really does promote um and and we have quite a lot of staff on on various comments um my comment to the pra was really useful and interesting in in developing my knowledge of of the insurance market and the insurance sector in a bit more detail especially because I've I've only ever worked at GAD, so I've not kind of seen that private sector environment. Um, and yes, I think in particular with my comment to the Centre for Disaster Protection, um, it's been really valuable to kind of understand um, this area of work in a lot more detail and just be really immersed in it. I think you know, I've worked with the Centre for a for a couple of years before my secondment. Um, and, you know, it's been brilliant, worked on quite a variety of really interesting projects. But I think to actually really get under the skin of kind of what 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 the centre are trying to do and how this, um, you know, what what the priorities are, what is important in this sector, I think it's it's been really valuable to to go on a secondment and do that because it, you know, you, it's really, there's a lot of stuff that you get out of secondments that, are, are very valuable and you don't necessarily think they're valuable until you do it so I think it's um you know um there's that knowledge building but there's also you know building that network and and um learning different ways of working as well so I think with each comment I've done I've, I've brought different things back to GAD um so I think yeah I think they're really really useful. So tell us a bit about the centre what does it do why was it set up um and what does SCAD do for the centre? Okay, yep. Yeah. So, um, so at the the Centre for Disaster Protection was um, started in twenty seventeen, um, and it's actually it's funded um, through UK aid um, through the UK government, um, and the real mission of the centre is around changing the way that the world plans and prepares for disasters, um, and also the way that the world pays for disasters. So um, their mission is around driving um, and delivering more effective disaster risk financing. Um, so the, um, the Government Actuaries Department has worked with the centre for um, pretty much since the start, actually, um, in, in providing um, actuarial support and analytical support as well, um, because the centre has um, quite a variety of, sort of functions and roles, um, one of those being an advisory role, so giving advice to uh, multilateral organisations, um, development banks, country governments, um, non-government organisations. So um, that that advisory function um, focuses on sort of delivering more effective disaster risk financing, and and GAD's support has been in 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 helping to helping to achieve that. So um, we've been um, working with the centre now for a number of years to 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 really support that advisory function. So. I'd love to hear about some of those projects, but can you explain first what disaster <laughs> risk financing is? Yes. So. Um, so disaster risk financing, perhaps if I sort of break it down, so the disaster risk part, I guess, first. Um, so when we think about that, we think about different types of crises. So um, be they sort of climatic crises like uh, drought and flood, um, but also things like epidemics as well. And obviously these um, crises have big impact on lives and livelihoods. Um, and they're also becoming more intense and and more frequent given climate change as well so um 
particularly for those living in poverty and the most vulnerable countries, they can have it can have a huge impact. Um, and traditionally, the way of financing these disasters was quite sort of reactive. Um, so thinking about things like humanitarian appeals and and the funding that comes in in those circumstances can be quite uncertain um, can be quite lumpy in terms of kind of timing and when when it comes in. Um, and it's not always sort of targeted at those that are the most in need. So that's the kind of traditional way of of, of the way that sort of disasters were financed. Um, things are changing and um, the way that uh, the centre um, views disaster risk finance, they want to improve the way that, um, that the world kind of plans and prepares for disasters and finances them by by having... Um, by by preparing before the disaster occurs, so the disaster is financing um, that that w- that the centre is looking to to um, sort of I suppose the the effective disastrous financing that the centre is trying to achieve is around um, sort of being timely, having good quality financing, having financing that that targets those that are most in need. Um, And when I talk about disastrous financing, it can be quite a variety of things. So um, things like so if you're looking at a country government, it might be things like um, budgetary mechanisms like reserve funds or contingency budgets to, to cover the cost of disasters when they occur. But it can also be risk transfer instruments as well. So things like um, insurance, particularly parametric insurance, but also like um, uh, catastrophe bonds um, or contingent credit. Um, so there can be quite a variety of finan- financing mechanisms as well that come under disastrous financing. Um, I think the other thing that's probably worth saying is that um, disaster risk financing is kind of part of the solution to managing the way that these crises are managed. So um, disaster risk management is is another arm to that. Um, Things like climate adaptation as well. So they kind of all fit together to to, to sort of manage and, and, and prepare for disasters. And what are the ways that you measure the impact or the efficiency or efficacy of disaster risk financing? That, that's a really good question. So I think, um, and it's something that I've been looking at and, and talking to people about whilst I've been at the, the centre. Um, that's something that comes up a lot is around sort of value for money and what what actually is good quality disaster risk financing. Because I suppose immediate reaction might be cost and cost efficiencies but that's not actually always um you know the the key priority and the key focus um as i say timely disastrous financing is is incredibly important um so making sure that funds arrive um when when needed um and also as i say that timing aspect that's why I gave an example of parametric insurance, you know, triggers um, for that insurance funds to, to come in um, can be based on things like forecasts. And so actually having that timing where, you know, perhaps there could be a forecast before the event occurs and then the funding starts to flow through. So actually when the event happens, there is something there to get started. Um, so as I say, there's timeliness. There's also um, things around sort of the actual amounts as well so actually how much is needed that can be the thing that's a bit difficult when I talked about the sort of t- traditional way of, of, of funding disasters around humanitarian assistance actually how much is needed when a disaster occurs um, and that can be incredibly hard to quantify um, and it's something you know that, that a lot of people are working on and are still working on but um, that that can be one of the issues as well so yeah, quality can mean and 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 good value can can mean lots of different things actually, um, in this context. So it's not always about cost efficiency. And can you talk a little bit about the human impacts as well? So psychological or societal impacts? Yeah. So um, obviously um, there is you know there the, there can be a variety of impacts when these disasters occur both in terms of obviously lives lost but also livelihoods lost um particularly around so um when we think about different financing mechanisms some of them are are 
in relation to agricultural insurance, for example. So, um, you know, when a crisis occurs, if it's a country that's particularly, you know, got a particularly large agricultural sector and you have, you know, farmers where if their crops are decimated, that's their livelihood gone. So, you know, they can it can be huge in terms of um, personal impact. Um, as you say, there's the psychological impact, but there's also... Um, Something that is is key and comes up a lot in disastrous financing is is around gender inequality as well, around um, women being um, impacted um, in particular. So it it it's it, there is there are a lot of ways of breaking down that impact, not just in terms of um, in terms of cost, but in terms of actually, as you say, there's the human side as well. Um, are there any example projects that you want to talk us through or maybe even arrangements that have had to kick in? Yes, so I think um I mean one of the projects in particular that I've that I've worked on more recently has been um working on a disaster risk financing strategy for an African um, country, so working with the government there, and also with um, a donor-funded program who's supporting them in developing this strategy, and it's been really interesting because it's been, um, I guess, putting into practice a lot of the stuff that I've learned. Um, the structure around that strategy is structured around the way that the centre views DRF. So um, there's kind of four chapters to that so looking at um the the context the money in um as, as the center call it so the the financial instruments that are used to, to fund um disaster risk um the money out so how to actually get that funding out to those most in need and that can be particularly difficult in terms of targeting and different mechanisms that can be used um and then finally the sort of the processes and the governance around all of that so um yeah, this project's been really interesting in kind of bringing all that stuff together. In particular, my role has been around the money inside, so the financial mechanisms. So um, it kind of links into to what I was talking about earlier around value for money. So um, the work that I've been doing there has been around developing a framework to assess value for money um, and the way in which the government could work through um, some a framework with steps um, to try and determine what the best kind of um, uh, selection of instruments might be um, based on their need and and what and how they value um, the, the the I guess the ultimate goal the ultimate objective what their priorities are so um, that's been really interesting because um, there has been a quant I suppose an analytical side to it in terms of um, um, I did some analysis of the marginal opportunity costs of different financial mechanisms and what that looks like over different return periods. So that was, see, quite analytical and felt quite actuarial. Um, but there's also the other side around sort of wider considerations. Um, as I mentioned, actually, the availability of some of these instruments, the timeliness of them, um, who actually owns the risk and how that's managed. So, um, you know, the the analytical approach has been very useful but actually some of these wider considerations can can trump that kind of analytical work um so i think that's some it's kind of speaks to one of the lessons that i've learned on my secondment is that um context is really key um in this sector so um you know, the you, you can do a lot of analytical work, you can think about the theory around insurance and these different mechanisms, but in the end, priorities can differ. And um, yeah, it, it sort of taught me a lot that it's it actually thinking of the wider um, context and what are the key considerations rather than just sort of going straight into the analysis has, has, has been really interesting. Uh, so you mentioned climate change before. Do you want to talk a bit about how your work relates to climate change? Yes. Um, so, so from a climate change perspective, so I guess disastrous financing is um, is I suppose is more immediate in the sense that um, the, the the financing is needed where there is sort of a quick response needed or where you know, large risk crystallizes and you need that funding. Um, and as I say, there are different financing mechanisms, one of which might be insurance. So I suppose you could look at it in the same way as insurance. 
in terms of sort of climate adaptation and climate change, obviously climate change will have an impact on the risks that we're looking at. Um, obviously, climatic risk um, is a big thing, and in particular, things like drought and flood. So th these will only intensify and and become more frequent. I think climate adaptation kind of goes um, is 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 longer term, and it kind of connects to disaster risk financing. But disaster risk financing kind of isn't part of climate adaptation. Um, so they're kind of <laughs> sort of working together, but not um, not kind of overlapping necessarily. Um, I think on. On climate change in particular, it can, um, yeah, it can be, it, obviously impacts are quite wide ranging. And in particular, some of the countries that the centre works with, you know, they, they are, um, they can be at the forefront of this. You know, they, they can be, you know, they're, they're vulnerable countries in terms of um, climate impacts. Um, and that's something that's, it talked about a lot and you know it's particularly at cop around kind of how to um how to make sure that everyone's got a voice and that we work through these issues there's a lot of, sort of open ended questions around kind of how to tackle climate related issues particularly um in the disastrous financing space um but yeah it's it's something i think Will, will be worked through over the next few, few years. It's a very, um, you know, hot topic, but it's, um, yeah, something that I think everyone has to kind of come together and, and work on. Yeah, I, I want to come back to this idea of justice and collaboration, um, but I'd like to bring in also your work on biodiversity. So can you tell us about your involvement in this subject? Yes. Um, so, um I am on the Biodiversity Working Party, uh, the IFOA, um, and um, have been on the Working Party for about three years now. Um, and we've done um, quite a bit of work in terms of um, building knowledge and research and thinking about um, sort of how actuaries can be involved and what the financial impacts are of, of biodiversity loss. Um, and it's something that I'm particularly passionate about, um, nature and conservation in particular. So um, when the opportunity came up to, to join the working party, I was I was very keen um, to kind of bring sort of my outside interests and my uh, my working interests together. Um, we've done yeah we've 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 created quite a lot of uh, publications, um, in particular research around. Um, the justice impacts of, of biodiversity loss, um, ways of valuing biodiversity. Um, I was I worked on a paper on sort of the link between biodiversity loss and zoonotic diseases, which was quite um, you know quite a, a current issue with 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 COVID. Um, so yes, there's, there's quite a range of different aspects that we've looked at. Um, I, I find it really interesting, in particular, because it's it's. It's becoming, it's getting a lot more interest now. Um, there are biodiversity cops as well as the climate cops um, and lots of sort of, I guess, there's a lot there's a lot of focus on 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 biodiversity at risks and biodiversity loss it, you know there there are programs tv programs about it there is um on on the kind of regulatory side there's a lot more work being done about it in terms of um so trying to push forward with uh, task force for nature related disclosures as well as as tcfd um i think you know, I'd, I'd, I'd probably like it to be more prevalent in people's minds in the sense of, um, you know, it's one of the big, big global risks um, and, um, you know, quite an existential risk in the sense of, I think a lot of um, work and um, a lot of, um, uh, I suppose, a lot of the stuff that we see day to day is around climate and that being the big issue. I think biodiversity is is as, as big an issue and actually they're really interlinked. So climate change um, exacerbates biodiversity loss um, and by, you know, on the on the other side, biodiversity loss can, can exacerbate climate change because when you're removing things like trees and peat bogs, um, you know, climate, uh, sorry, carbon is sequestered into the uh, into the atmosphere um, a lot more. So it, it it's quite interesting how, how there's that linkage there. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's it's a really interesting area of work to be looking at. 
Um, and I think actuaries can do a lot in this space. There's, um, you know, it's it's an emerging risk. Um, there's still a lot to be done in terms of actually understanding the risk, quantifying it, in, in particularly from a financial sector aspect. Um, and so I think that's something that actuaries can can really, you know, it's an area where we can really add value in particular. So actually thinking about metrics and ways of monitoring the risk and also, um, you know, quantifying the risk and coming up with scenarios and, and stress testing. Um, so I think I think there's there's quite a lot that that can be done in this space and and I hope will be done over the coming years. Yeah, and do you want to comment on things that are already happening? So I know I think you mentioned some of these in the uh, zoonotic diseases um, paper. Yeah, so um, th- there is there is a lot already happening in this space, and I think um, you know there's been some some big publications, in particular things like the Dasgupta report that was that was commissioned mm-hmm. um, by the UK government to look at the financial impacts of biodiversity, um, and um, as I say, there's the, the the biodiversity COP, which which happened um, um, sort of in, in two stages over the past couple of years. Um, and so there's a lot more focus on targets for biodiversity and 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 things that can be done there. Um, so from a I guess from a governmental perspective, there's 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 there is, there are, there are things being done and there are there are things happening out there. From a financial perspective, I guess there is there is focus on kind of the ways of valuing biodiversity and actually ways to. I suppose integrate biodiversity risk within financial the financial sector. So, for example, there have been um, some some really interesting examples of of ways to kind of, um, I guess, value biodiversity and and financial mechanisms for managing biodiversity. So, for example, there are sort of green bonds and blue bonds as well. So, for example, in I think it was 2018, the Seychelles issued a, a blue bond, um, which effectively um, raised money for managing um, uh, pre- protected marine areas um, and, and um, fishing, um, better kind of standards of fishing. So I think there, there, are, there are lots going on and it is quite, I guess, both, it, it's, it's a... In terms of the risk itself and, um, you know, when you think about the impacts, it can be incredibly sad, but it's also quite an exciting time because I think people are starting to turn their attention to it and, and there could be some quite interesting developments in this area, I think. And So this has been really interesting. Can you tell us a bit about your thoughts on where else in the public sector you think actuaries can add value? Um, yes, yeah, so I think in terms of... I mean, the thing that I found working at GAD has been that actuaries can turn the hand to lots of different things. Um, I think wherever there's the you know the the next big challenge for government, um, that 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 can be something that actuaries can turn the hand to. I think you know where where there are emerging risks like cyber or pandemic risk or. Um, or you no know, biodiversity or climate change. I think that that that's an area where actuaries can definitely add value. I think from, I guess, a public sector perspective, that I think we. I mean, I think actuaries are involved uh, throughout really public sector in the sense that, um, as you mentioned, the PRA. So on the regulatory side. Um, at GAD from a kind of government side. Um, there are a number of actuaries, as I say, um, uh, at the centre, but also within the development space, so working with different international organisations. So I think, you know, that actuaries, actuaries are everywhere, um, but it's, um, I, th- I think we just need to keep, you know, um, keeping part of the conversation and understanding where we add value. I think the thing that I've, learned being at GAD and at the centre has been that actuaries bring a lot around sort of understanding risk, um, being able to quantify that risk, but also I think actually having that sort of professional rigour in terms of, um, you know, putting processes and logical thinking around things. So I think we we can add a lot more 
than you know necessarily falling back on the sort of analytical side but actually we can add a lot more in terms of um you know knowledge building in terms of like f- financial mechanisms and things like that but also as i say kind of actually wrapping processes around things thinking about quality and and how to 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 make sure that that whatever we're doing um you know is 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 well communicated and well structured um so i think i've i've found that to be something that, that that that's really stood out to me um over the over the, f- the last few years but so for the rest of us who work in the private sector i think from our conversation so far the line doesn't seem that clear anyway so a lot of the risk transfer mechanisms are provided by the private sector they also provide some of the capital um could you uh, share some observations from interactions with the private sector perhaps and any critiques or feedback or advice <laughs> um i think no i think i think as you say there there is quite um a crossover at times between the two i think um i guess at the center i found with with drf as you say some of these financial mechanisms are are led by the private sector and i think from that perspective um i think it's sort of understanding what the key challenges are in terms of so you know insurance for example can be really useful in terms of um you know um i guess cost efficiencies from covering large risks or um you know kind of having that sort of operational element as well in terms of um timeliness and and also ensuring that 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 you know organizations or countries that don't necessarily have lots of funding don't have to hold that money back but i guess the trade offs can be that it's it's i suppose it can be difficult to know kind of i guess who owns the risk and what's being insured and also as i say the big the big um area of of, of difficulty can be around how much you know what the payout actually might be and and what what is the need um so i think there's a lot more in terms of um you know um developments in terms of kind of how to how to make that those type of products i guess more effective um particularly things around so um obviously i mentioned parametric insurance that can be a really valuable tool in this context but sometimes it can be difficult where you've got things like basis risks where by you know, a, a, a insurance payout triggers when it didn't necessarily need to, or it might not trigger, and and that country or that organisation desperately needs that money. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think there's probably still a lot more to think through in terms of how to, I guess, adapt products that might already be ex- be existing and make them relevant for the development sector. So I think, um, yeah, there's there's probably lots more to be done. But I think, yeah, there's there's there's, there's that sort of, um, yeah, there, there is there's a lot of compliment complementarities to it. Um, yeah, um, Georgie, thank you so much for joining us today. No, that's uh, thank you very much as well. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed it.